So um, today I'm going to try to do one of those things I call a review, but last section didn't think it was a review at all. I don't know where the disconnect is, but somewhere there's a disconnect. Um, but I'm going to try to save that for like the last 20 minutes of class. Now, the reason I'm trying to save that for the last 20 minutes of class is um, the first section had so many questions specifically about the tutorials that we took up 30 minutes of class just talking about what these things tutorials are. So what I'm going to do is open up the floor to any questions we might have. I'm sure because I just primed you all that we can talk about tutorials that you all will ask about those. But by all means, if people have other questions about uh, any content we've covered, um, anything related to the course, LaTeX, our Markdown, our studio, whatever, please jump in and ask questions. I've never been super successful at, at like uh, poking and prodding students to ask questions over Zoom. I know all the tricks when it's in-person classes. I know how to force you to ask questions. I don't know how to do it here. And if campus goes even to partly online or back to in person next semester, I may not have to ever learn. Okay, I'm going to wait one more minute. And then if nobody asks questions, I'm going to try to repeat the discussion we had about tutorials, the third piece of your grade for this course. make a comment on asking questions on Zoom. Yeah, I find fair. that um, it seems that whenever somebody breaks the ice, so to say, then it mm -hmm. opens up the floor, which is kind of one of those just weird things, maybe uh, part of the social aspect of being in a Zoom class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then my differential equations class, he's very persistent and like goes down the line and calls people out, which is like, you know, oh. That's one method, but I, I can't find bring that, myself to do that. Yeah, it, it kind of feels it like sounds like Rosenhaus if right? I had to guess. It sure is, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which I've taken his class in person, and I love it in class. Totally. And it, go, I think it goes very much better in class. Yep. But yep. yeah. And I take the opposite approach, where I really try not to pick on anybody. I've picked on you a few times, but for Which the most I part, enjoy. yeah. <laughs> For the most part, I try not to pick on anybody, but it, it leaves a lot of awkward silence. So can you then let's just get get it rolling a little bit. Give uh, another like basic coverage of the tutorials. We're supposed to just like explain. Yep, yep, yep. Let's three do different it. ones, right? Two tutorials. Sounded like you said three, so let's just make I did it clear. Say three, but Cool. Yep, two no, tutorials. Good. Okay, so in my mind, these tutorials are in place of exams. You're going to write two tutorials. Each tutorial will be about a different topic. I'm going to, in the next like 25 minutes, list some topics. And if you all pick a topic that I've already listed, then that's already basically approved by me. But if you all get creative and want to pick some of your own topics that you don't hear me list today, then I ask that you run it by me first, whether um, that happens in email or office hours, I don't care. But if you're going to get creative, I want to be like the bumpers to your bowling lane on that. Um, I want to try to manage the topics you all pick. Um, Tutorials theoretically can be submit anytime throughout the semester. Uh, again, um, if you're picking topics for like the next week's uh, content to come, then of course I think it's going to be easiest to keep up with the content. But if you know life throws curveballs at you and you're not able to do the tutorials until finals week or whatever, that's totally fine by me. I'm trying to keep this class flexible. At, uh, 
at detriment to some, but I'm trying to keep the class flexible so that if life throws weird things at you, you can submit everything as late as you need to. So theoretically, these tutorials are only due by the end of the semester. So here's the thought. The goal for these tut tutorials is to write materials, like write uh, a section of a book almost. The way you should think about it is, I want you to pick a specific topic and write the section in a math 350 book on that topic. So this is very similar to your course notes, but I think the key takeaway here is I want the audience to be different. For your course notes, you are your future audience. For your course notes, I want you to write to future you. But for these tutorials, I want you to write the tutorials as if you're writing to someone just enrolling in Math 350 who has never seen these topics before. So I want you to strongly consider um, someone who has never seen these topics before, whatever two topics you pick, and write one tutorial for each topic you pick to someone who has never seen this content before. Okay, um, so someone asked last class how long they should be. And to be honest, this is the toughest part I have about describing these. So I want these tutorials written in R Markdown, just the same as your course notes are. So by the end of the semester, you will turn in three files. You'll turn in three files. You'll turn in one file for your course notes, you're turning one file for your first tutorial and one file for your second tutorial. So you'll have three files by the end. But each of these I'm recommending to you to write in R Markdown and then knit them to HTML. Well, when you knit to HTML, there's no more pages. Pages are completely lost in HTML. And I don't mean web page here. I mean like pages in a book. So I don't know how to, tell, how to tell you how long these tutorials need to be because I can't just say they need to be three pages. There are no pages in an HTML document. So what I've done instead is tried to provide a really specific outline that each tutorial should follow. And so the outline goes like this. I want you to provide an introduction, one or two paragraphs that motivates the problem or the topic or the concept one to two paragraphs introduction. I want you to provide next a specific example. That's like a really easy example where you very, um, where you give a really simple explanation of the topic or concept that you're gonna be discussing in this tutorial. So that example should be basically another paragraph or so. Then I want you to give a general idea of what the topic or concept is. And now that's where the like strict math notation is going to come in. This is where you're going to show off your LaTeX skills. In the general section, you're going to write in all generality, the mathematics behind the topic of a particular tutorial. So that's going to be like another paragraph or two. And then a different is example. He coming in for anyone else? No, he froze. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Edward, we lost like the last 30 seconds of what you just said. OK. I see that now. Thanks. In all generality, something about mathematics, and you're, you're frozen again. Oh. Are we back in? I'm dancing for you it so you can like see it. some movement. OK. So it's in all general, weird because it's happening very rigidly. Oh, interesting. Um, okay, so hopefully I'm back in, and hopefully this works out. You know, I saw a Comcast outside my house just before the class started, so hopefully they're not messing up my internet connection. So the uh, third section of your tutorials is going to be the general section where you introduce the mathematical notation behind the concepts. 
So whatever concept or topic you pick for the tutorial, in this next section, I've labeled general. This is where you introduce all of the very general mathematics behind the idea. So this is where you show off your latex skills here in this section. And this is gonna be another paragraph or two to introduce the mathematics behind the topic. Okay, so did everybody get the uh, idea of the general section? Thank you, thank you, some nods along, I appreciate that. So then after the general section, you're gonna introduce another specific example. The specific example that follows the general mathematics is to showcase an aspect of the topic that is not obvious from the math notation. So a lot of the ideas in this world of statistics are not obvious from the general notation. So I'm going to ask you to use this second specific example as a way to highlight some non-obvious takeaways from the specific topic. Okay, and then a conclusion. So if we had to count paragraphs, I would say something roughly like this. For the introduction, one or two paragraphs. Specific example, maybe one paragraph. So we're up to like two or three paragraphs. General, another one to two paragraphs. So that would put you at like three to five paragraphs. A different example, probably one more paragraph. That's gonna put you at like four to six paragraphs. And then a conclusion, something like five to seven paragraphs in total with mathematics uh, and or R code and LaTeX sprinkled throughout the entire thing. Now it's up to you all. If you wanna pick like, here's just a few quick ideas. If you wanna pick like an introduction to R as one of your tutorials, that's a great idea. Maybe you think your current understanding of R could benefit future Math 350 students by introducing it differently than I did. I'm not going to take offense to say, I don't like the way Edward introduced R. I would prefer to see it introduced like this. So you write your own tutorial on introducing R. In that case, you're going to need some R code within R code chunks, and you're probably going to need some R code like appropriately highlighted within the text itself. If you want to write a tutorial on introducing LaTeX, that's totally fine. In that case, you'd have like LaTeX code sprinkled throughout. You'd have to be careful though, because sometimes you would want to highlight the code that makes the symbols separately from the symbols themselves. If you want to give an introduction on R Markdown, that seems like a great topic you could then uh, do a combo of R code and LaTeX in your presentation. Now, all the way down at the bottom of our syllabus is a course outline. Basically, any bullet point here is another reasonable topic for a tutorial. So if you wanted to highlight random variables in a tutorial and you wanted to talk about how they're not actually random and they're not actually variables, then that would be a great topic for one tutorial. Now, if you wanted to pick a topic like expectation, I would strongly encourage you to narrow down that topic and instead pick a specific function within the world of expectation. So like probability itself is an expectation of an indicator function. So you would do a tutorial on probability. And if you wanted to frame it in terms of expectation, you would highlight probability as an expectation of an indicator function. Or you could pick a mean. A mean is an expectation of a very particular function, specifically the identity function. Or you could pick the variance, or you could pick these things we haven't seen yet, but we will this week, percentiles. You could pick any of these specific expectations, but I definitely recommend that if you want to focus on expectation, you pick out particular expected values 
instead of trying to write about the whole thing. Okay, so do you all have a better sense of what I want these tutorials to be? Are there any follow-up questions before I say a few more things? Seems clear to me. Good, thanks. Honestly, Other it actually seems more simple than I had originally anticipated. Good. Which is kind of cool, yeah. Great, and in fact, I'm gonna try to simplify it for us a little bit more because I know some people are feeling a little overwhelmed this semester. I have one quick question. Um, it relates to this to tutorial, but also it also kind of applies to the uh, like general course notes as well. But if we um, if we include um, images in our tutorial, um, mm -hmm. we like locally on our machine we have to include the uh, file in the in the same directory. So do we upload those files with the uh, our markdown file or yeah? Or, okay. Great question, Gary. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to ask you all to email me these files. And so if you're including images in the file, uh, in your R Markdown document, you're going to need to email me the image and the R Markdown file. Now, an alternative to that is you could, if you have access to host files online somewhere, is you could include the image by a URL. Just as a second option. That sounds good. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Scary. That's a great question. Um, that brings up another good point. Uh, if you want, and I'm just suggesting, if you want, you could create videos that are like, you know, how I sometimes go through R and I'm like, Oh, watch me do some R stuff. If you want to create a video to embed in your tutorial, then that's a totally uh, fun and creative idea. And it could take the place of one of your examples. So you could embed in the R Markdown document a video that you create inside the R Markdown document to help your future Math 350 colleagues better understand the topic of your tutorial. I don't yet know how to embed a video in a R Markdown document, but I'm gonna make a note of that and look it up. Okay, I just made my note of that so I can get back to that later. Okay, so here we go. I was threatening to make it even easier for you in case you're feeling overwhelmed this semester with work. I think these tutorials are very similar to your course notes. The only difference is how you consider the audience in your write-up. So if you want to minimize work for yourself in the uh, rest of the semester, what I'd suggest you do is pick as one of your tutorial topics or both, pick as your topics, any of the future week's content. So like next week, we're gonna look at properties of the normal distribution. And so what you could do is write one tutorial on properties of the normal distribution and then just copy and paste your tutorial into your course notes. So you don't have to double up on the content for any given week. Instead, you can just write the tutorial on a specific topic, as long as it follows along with our uh, lecture content, and then just copy and paste that in your course notes. And that way you like minimize the, your future effort in the rest of the semester. Does that make sense? Got some nods. Not too many nods, just a few. Okay, other follow up questions on tutorials.
the conclusion is pretty long. Um, what do you want exactly in that? The conclusion like is long? Isn't it like five to seven paragraphs? Oh, no. The conclusion is one paragraph for a total okay. of five to seven. Sorry oh, about that, Jacob. Gotcha. Okay, so the whole tutorial should be something like five to seven paragraphs. And the conclusion should be one paragraph by itself. So it's like one to two for the introduction, one for an example. So that brings us to like two to three. One to two paragraphs for the general concept. So that brings us like to four to five. One more for the specific example. So that's like five to six. And then the conclusion is one more paragraph for something like five to seven paragraphs. Sorry about that. Thanks for asking. No, that makes a lot of sense. You know, when you write the conclusion, it's a lot of just repeating yourself anyway. Even if you do it in one paragraph, even if you write just a one paragraph conclusion, you're gonna feel like you're repeating yourself and you are, but that's the point. And if you wrote a conclusion that was five to seven paragraphs, boy, you just repeat the whole thing. <laughs> okay, how about I give us like another minute and a half to ask some follow-up questions, whether it's on tutorials or otherwise. And if no one chimes in, I'll get to um, writing on the whiteboard. Can you explain a little bit more what general means? Sure, so let's pick, an ex let's pick a topic. and then maybe it'll be a little bit more clear. So if I wanted to introduce probability, I might give an example, a specific example, where you're like the probability of seeing um, two, four, or six on a fair coin is one half. And you might write that out mathematically. In the general section, you would address how you talk about probability mathematically. So in that case, probability is actually defined as an expectation of an indicator function on, in this case, from our specific example, it would be an indicator function on the set one subscript to, uh, it would be, sorry, let me start again. It would be an expectation on the indicator function where the indicator function is defined relative to the set two, four, and six, right? So in the general section, you would say the probability of a set A is equal to the expectation of an indicator function defined for some set A. It would be much more general than a specific example, but it should equally apply to the specific example. So let's see if I can type it out in the chat. So I'm thinking of a fair die here. So in the chat, I typed out like a specific example and then generally what the mathematical notate notation is behind probability. Probability is actually just an expectation of a specific function. And so all I'm asking you to do in the general portion is write out the mathematics behind your concept or topic.
And then, I don't know, you might follow it up with another <clears throat> specific example. Sure, Jared, that's a great way to think about it. General is with variables and specific is with numbers. Any other last minute questions? I mean, it's not like this is your last opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you can ask questions about tutorials every week for the rest of the semester, but maybe last minute for the day. All right, I'm changing the screen, which is my threat that we're about to move on. Okay, here we go. So the way we are starting to understand statistics is through two different kind of viewpoints. Let's call them viewpoints. Uh, the side we've been focusing on for the most part in this class is distributions. So as a quick example, you might imagine we have a Bernoulli distribution. Now I've told you all that Bernoulli distributions describe outcomes where there's only two options. So it's either yes or no, pass or fail, uh, vote for party A or vote for party B. And there is no party C, D, or E. There's only party A and party B. Well, the way we are as statisticians trained to think about these outcomes where there's only two options is as a Bernoulli distribution. You label the option of interest a one, and the option that you're less interested, a zero. And those are your only two possible outcomes. Now, what we're starting to do is think about these outcomes as random variables. So I'm putting those um, little dashes on all of the Xs to remind us that these are capital letters. The way we're to think about these random variables is this value is not yet known. This value came from a Bernoulli distribution and it takes on some value, but we don't yet know what value it is. So we call it a random variable because we don't know what value it takes on and it takes on a specific value, we call it a random variable, even though random variables are actually functions. So this random variable as a function really just takes us from party A, party B to one and zero. The goal of the random variable is to convert us into numbers. The goal of the random variable is to convert us into numbers. All of the distributions in the world of statistics are based on numbers because they're just functions but many of the processes in the world around us are based on non-number things like eye color or hair color or which um, party in an election you might vote for. It could be like Democrat or Republican. Well, you can't do math on Democrat or Republican. So the way um, statisticians think about this is they let the random variable translate from words to numbers for them. So a Bernoulli random variable might go from Democrat or Republican to one or zero. So this random variable here is going to be a one or a zero, representing whichever party they voted for. 
and you can really assign Democrat to one or zero and Republican to the other zero or one. So the way we think about these random variables is we have a bunch of them. And this is as if we went out into the real world and we sampled a bunch of people. We collected a bunch of people from the United States and we asked them, which party are you gonna vote for in the next election? You're either gonna vote for party one or party zero. But before we ask them, we don't know what value they will say. So we call them random variables. Now on the other side of statistics is actual data. So the actual data is little values corresponding to what these random variables might be. We have little data over here that is actual ones and zeros, and they correspond to the values these random variables might take on. We think of the random variables as random before we ask someone who they're going to vote for. We don't know whether they're voting for one or voting for zero. But once we, and this process is called sample the data, once we take a sample of data, we then have a bunch of ones and zeros. Okay, the way we've introduced this is very general. This Bernoulli distribution works for a bunch of different processes in the world. And as long as I leave my random variables as capital letters and my data as lowercase letters, then the picture I have here can describe a bunch of different scenarios in the real world. For instance, a Bernoulli distribution could describe a vote in the United States where you're only voting for one of two parties. In that case, we don't know the true probability P that any given person will vote for party one. It could, this Bernoulli distribution could describe the probability that one of Google's servers fails there is some probability P that one of Google's servers fails, but we don't know what that probability is. It's probably a pretty low probability, something like 1%, maybe even less than 1% that Google's servers fail. But the Bernoulli distribution can very easily capture that because the only requirement we need is that there's two options. And whatever those two options may be named, we label them one or zero. Okay, how's this going? This all seems like review, right? Some yeses, some noes, some head scratching, nods, thanks. Okay, so the question then is, until somebody interrupts me, how did these two worlds connect? other than through data. The connection goes like this. If you have a bunch of data, in this case, just imagine ones and zeros, and you add them all up and divide by however many there are, that operation is called a mean. Literally just add up all the numbers and divide by however many there are. Now I'm gonna try to write this out with a vector X. So I'm gonna put that little tilde underneath it. That's just total made up notation to say, remember the mean of a vector is what I'm suggesting here with this notation. So in R, there is no equivalent of this tilde. Vectors in R are just labeled as single letters, X or Y or Z or whatever. So I'm just reminding us that when we calculate the mean, we always do it on a vector. We always do it on a vector with a sample size, capital N. 
And now the way this works in statistics I'm pausing for a good while here because it looks like I'm on lag again. <laughs> 